Hey everybody, welcome to day two of DockerCon. Y'all have fun yesterday? All right, how many of you were at the party last night? Okay, then maybe you shouldn't clap so loud. Uh, uh, before I get started, I do want to give a big uh, round of thanks to the sponsors for the party last night, uh, Datadog and IBM. Really appreciate all of your support. Um, and I uh, also should say that in addition to supporting the party last night, um, whenever we look at who the top contributors are to, uh, to Docker external, uh, IBM consistently ranks in the top. So I want to thank uh, IBM for being a big sponsor, not only of uh, the party, but for Docker in general. So thank you. All right, so yesterday we talked a lot about democratizing uh, the use of Docker for developers and democratizing the use of Docker in orchestration. Uh, you saw us show you Docker for Mac and Docker for Windows, which got uh, developers, even developers like Anand, up and running in 10 minutes, uh, able to debug, able to start coding, able to contribute, able to build, which was pretty incredible. Uh, we also saw Docker for uh, Azure and Docker for AWS, which makes it possible to get Docker running uh, in an easy, uh, optimized way within, uh, within, uh, within the cloud. Uh, and you saw Docker for uh, Docker 1.12. Um, Docker 1.12 included Obviously, built-in orchestration, the ability to build self-orchestrating, self-healing uh, self clusters. You saw the ability to deploy applications composed of multiple containers as service bundles. You saw the ability to have uh, mesh networking. Uh, and you saw the ability to have integrated security throughout. That was all pretty incredible. Um, and again, it's all about making sure that we've democratized Docker for the developer and democratized Docker for ops. Today is going to be about democratizing Docker for the enterprise. And democratizing Docker for the enterprise, of course, builds on what we talked about yesterday. But it also means that we need to make sure that Docker is easy, easy to adopt in organizations that have a lot of developers, that have a lot of people who are in operations, where people build a lot of applications, where they're dealing with applications uh, that are both legacy and new, uh, where there are complex issues, there are compliance issues, there's procurement issues, there's adoption issues, there's cultural change issues. Um, wow, I'm probably... Uh, I'm making a lot of you feel a little down, but don't worry, because there are solutions to all of these issues. Um, but we understand that adopting Docker in the enterprise is really a multifaceted uh, multi problem. Um, and part of that gets addressed with technology, but also part of it gets addressed with having good processes and procedures in place. And part of it honestly gets addressed by having uh, good use cases to follow. So we'll do a lot of cool demos today. Uh, we'll thank the demo gods for what they did yesterday. Hopefully they, are, they continue to be kind to us today. Uh, but we'll also have some uh, users up on stage who will talk to you about what it's really like to use Docker, some of the best learnings that they've had. But in any event, let's get started, Docker in the enterprise. And probably the most important thing to know about Docker in the enterprise is that, well, Docker is in the enterprise. Um, depending on whose surveys you look at, um, uh, uh, Docker is being used uh, somewhere between 30% and, in some cases, in some surveys, 73% of all enterprises. Now, I don't know what the right answer is. Um, it's probably something in between that. But nonetheless, it's very clear to me that Docker has gone from being something that's uh, purely an early adopter technology to something that's being used uh, uh, in the early mainstream. Um, when we survey Docker users ourselves, uh, we find that 60% of them say that they are deploying at least one Docker application in production. And over a quarter of them say that they've moved a majority of their applications into production. Beyond the numbers, when we look at the customers and the types of people who are using Docker, you know, and Docker at this point has uh, over 150 uh, enterprise customers and about 10,000 cloud customers, what we see is this includes not only people like you saw yesterday, the folks at Splice and the folks at Zenly, but we also have people at the largest financial institutions on the planet using Docker. We have large uh, uh, consumer goods. We have large manufacturers. We have people who are trying to keep planes in the air. We have people who are trying to keep trains running. We have people who are trying to keep our soldiers safe. We have people who are uh, trying to address health care. These are real serious enterprise use cases, and Docker is being used. And Docker is being used not because it's cool, but because Docker helps enable critical transformations. Now, you, know, you may say, oh, wow, this looks like a really buzzword compliance slide. Um, but underneath, underneath all of it is the fact that there are multiple real transformations that are happening. Uh, there's obviously in many organizations a need to move to the cloud. In many organizations, that's, uh, whether that's a private cloud or a public cloud uh, or you know, 
some CIOs fantasy. Um, there's a desire to be able to use the cloud more effectively. Clearly, a lot of people are looking to modernize their existing applications, and clearly a lot of people are looking to make uh, DevOps work. The data is also pretty clear that as people are adopting Docker, it's no longer simply for uh, next generation greenfield microservices applications. While clearly the top use cases uh, are in areas like that, if you look at that uh, chart uh, on Docker use cases, one of the most common use cases for Docker is migrating legacy apps to microservices. And an equally common uh, use case is containerizing legacy apps. Now you might say, containerizing a legacy app, that's heresy. But in fact, there are really good reasons to take a legacy app, Dockerize it, uh, and then move it around. Similarly, as you look at the workloads that people are using with Docker, uh, obviously a lot of uh, stateless workloads, but increasingly things like traditional databases being used in Docker. And what, again, this says to me is that when we talk to, to most organizations, it's not just a greenfield problem anymore. It's not just a greenfield opportunity anymore. They're looking to use Docker in an environment that has a mix of traditional infrastructure, next generation infrastructure, uh, public cloud, and a mix of applications. I guess if I can ask for a, a show of hands, how many people here are able to deploy Docker and are purely dealing with Greenfield? All right, how many people are looking uh, at an environment that looks like this, with a, with a set of different types of applications and a set of different kinds of infrastructures? All right, that's, that, that's the majority. Uh, and, and, that, and that's what we expected to hear. Uh, and that's what we hear when we talk to customers. Um, but if you have an environment that looks like this, um, there are certain ways that you can go about uh, adopting containerization in Docker, and there are certain ways that, quite frankly, are anti-patterns. And so I'm going to talk for a few minutes on some of those anti-patterns that we've seen. Uh, and the first sort of anti-pattern or fallacy that we see, I'll call the bimodal IT fallacy. And this is you know, promulgated by a lot of vendors. It's promulgated by uh, some analysts. But they basically say, look, you're either going to uh, have your cool microservices, greenfield applications, and then everything else is traditional apps on-premise, um, and you're going to have the people in your organization who work on the future and the people uh, in your organization who are going to be uh, shepherding your, your apps uh, until they die. And that's just a complete fallacy. Um, talk to most organizations. They've got a ton of value in their traditional apps. They've been built up with a lot of business knowledge and a lot of uh, expertise over many years. Uh, if you are an organization that has, as some of Docker customers do, 10,000 developers uh, spread over 60 different data centers, you're not going to be closing down all those data centers on day one. Um, and you're not going to be shutting down uh, the apps. And so what you need to do is really have a model that lets you migrate, that lets you run traditional apps on premise more effectively, that allows you to run traditional apps and migrate them to next generation private clouds or public clouds. And you also may want to have the ability to uh, do cool microservices, but do it on traditional infrastructure. And there's an approach there that works. Second fallacy that we see, uh, I'll call it the PaaS fallacy. And I say that with the knowledge that Docker itself, uh, when we were Doc Cloud, we're running a PaaS. Um, and this is a, a different flavor of the story that I think a lot of us have heard in IT, which is, hey, spend a lot of time, spend about uh, you know, a year implementing some new magic solution, and then everything is going to be perfect. Um, and in the case of many different approaches to PaaS, what that goes even further, it says the way to be agile is to A, spend a lot of money and spend uh, six months to a year implementing a way to become agile, which doesn't make a whole lot of sense. Uh, but then lock yourself into a solution that only works for a subset of your applications, uh, only works in a particular set of infrastructures, and even worse than that, assumes that we, the vendor, know what your infrastructure should be in the future. Uh, and trust us, we know what languages and tools and frameworks and testing methodologies you should use. As, as Solomon was saying yesterday, this is sort of not an example of tools getting out of the way. This is an example of tools trying to tell you what to do. There are plenty of good reasons you may want to adopt a PaaS. We talk to a lot of people who have good luck starting with a PaaS. Um, but frequently, we hear that you start with a PaaS, the first couple of months are good, and then the PaaS runs out of gas. A Slightly uh, uh, related fallacy is that the way to get to glory, the way to become agile, is to try and make yourself look like Amazon inside your four walls. Um, uh, there are a lot of great reasons why people will want to modernize their infrastructure. There are a lot of great reasons why people will want to uh, deploy 
uh, private clouds. Um, and that's fantastic. What is not fantastic is saying that deploying a, uh, a private cloud is the prerequisite to becoming agile, and that it's a prerequisite to adopting uh, a container-based approach. Um, again, this is a flavor that says you invest heavily, you take uh, a lot of time and a lot of dollars in order to build a private cloud. And again, that may be worth doing, but you know, let's recall that it took Amazon and Azure uh, and Google many years to become what they are. There's a reason why they're able to offer uh, cloud services effectively. Many organizations are not like that. Um, so again, you have a fallacy that says the only way to become agile, uh, which actually kind of goes against the whole philosophy of Docker and containers, is by locking your ability to be agile in your applications to your ability to be agile in your infrastructure. So what all three of these fallacies tend to have in common is that they you know, A, require a black and white view of the world, and B, they require a revolutionary change. And as Solomon said yesterday, we really don't believe in big revolutions. While we believe that Docker itself is revolutionary, the adoption of it can be done in an evolutionary way. You know, while Docker is disruptive, adopting it shouldn't disrupt your organization. And so you know, at Docker, we like to talk about incremental revolution. You, know, you saw yesterday us having a common demo that involved dogs and cats. You know, if you didn't like the voting, the way to, to fix that was to increase your votes. You know, it wasn't to launch some kind of radical uh, revolutionary approach towards, towards uh, having cats take over the world or dogs take over the world. By the way, it turns out there is a site that is entirely dedicated to revolutionary pictures of dogs and cats. Uh, it's obeythekitty.com. <laughs> there are business models everywhere. No, no, no. <laughs> But what do we mean by rev uh, incremental revolution? What we mean is that um, what you should do is try and find yourself an approach that lets you grow over time. And of course, you know, Docker believes that if you choose the right approach towards uh, Dockerizing, containerizing your applications, then you don't need to know in advance where you want to run them. And you shouldn't have to know in advance where you want to run them, because in many cases, you want to run them in different places. And over time, uh, one data center may be more economical than another, or one cloud provider may be more economical than the other. You certainly don't want to lock yourself in. And we also want to say that for, tradi for traditional apps, there is a lot of value in just simply dockerizing that app and then having the ability to move it around. So incremental revolution means that you're starting small. You're starting with a, the sort of least degree of uh, imposing uh, change on the organization as possible and allowing yourself the flexibility to grow over time. And this slide is talking about the ability to move flexibly and incrementally uh, on the vertical axis. Uh, but there really, there's also a, an importance to moving uh, horizontally as well, moving from right to left. And that's making it possible to take your traditional apps and build them and modify them and test them in a more agile way. And as we look across the Docker commercial customer base as well as our user base, while it's still very common that people start using Docker for a greenfield application, for a low-risk application. It's increasingly common that the way people start with Docker is by looking at some of their legacy applications. And as I said earlier, they take their legacy applications and they just Dockerize the whole thing. And you might ask, well, why would you do that? Well, it turns out there are a lot of useful reasons for Dockerizing a traditional application. One is you get portability. So it's a fairly frequent use case that people will uh, uh, you know, buy a new company. They want to keep their applications. They don't want to keep their data centers. By dockerizing the applications, uh, it becomes possible to move them, even without modifying the applications. Right? So it makes moving from one data center to another more easy. It makes moving from uh, on-prem to cloud a much uh, easier proposition. It also makes things that may sound trivial, but you know, upgrading from version 7 of your operating system to version 7.1 without having to retest all of your applications. That's a great move. But what it also does is it gives you the ability to build up muscle memory. It gives you the ability to get uh, as an organization, good at CI and CD, get good at using containers, get good at using automated testing. Um, it means that you're able to move more quickly from dev to test into production. And as a result, you have small wins, you have big wins, you have internal champions, and that makes it possible to start taking your existing applications and start in an organic way to decompose them and make them more agile. So it's a very frequent pattern that having dockerized an entire application, uh, you'll then you know, take a three-tier application and dockerize each tier, uh, or maybe dockerize the top two tiers. Uh, it's also a very frequent pattern that we see is that once people have gotten experience dockerizing a few traditional apps, they start looking across those apps and saying, oh, gee, 
all of these applications have a session manager. All of these applications uh, have an authentication layer. Let's experiment with pulling each of those out as their own, uh, as their own application in their own container, or hopefully soon in their own, as their own uh, application bundle. And as a result, you have a smooth path of going from traditional applications to making those applications more agile, as well as a smooth path of moving from more traditional infrastructure uh, to more modern infrastructure. Again, we call this the incremental rev revolution. Won't read through all of this, but the main point is you start small, you get quick wins, you build up muscle memory, and then you expand with a set of small successes that can lead to larger successes. So it's inevitable that people start with Docker small, and our business model is, is built around that. Um, but over time, of course, if you, things are going well, uh, you go from single developers to large teams with multiple different roles. You go from having single container apps to having multi-container apps. You go from having you know, primarily stateless apps to stateless and stateful. And of course, people start to move into production-sensitive uh, workloads. And at that point, there is a need for management. There's a need for uh, a balance uh, between agility, portability, and control. And that's where our commercial solutions come in. Um, You've heard a lot yesterday about making it easy for developers to get started, make it easy for them to choose the languages and frameworks and tools of their choice. You heard a lot about portability, the ability to move uh, any application uh, in a Docker container or a service bundle to run uh, anywhere that there's a Docker engine. Um, but in an environment that looks like that, you also need a level of control. And you want to make sure that the control is uh, at a level that doesn't impede agility and doesn't impede portability, but lets you know what's going on in your organization. And as we talk about Docker today, what you'll see is that expresses itself as the ability to know exactly what the life cycle is of every container, to really know the container supply chain. Know who created every container, where it came from, whether it's been tested, uh, whether it's been scanned for vulnerabilities, whether it's been approved for use in, in particular uh, environments. It requires the ability to see every container and every application and know where it's running and how it's running. It means the ability to quickly change things uh, if there are problems. Putting that together, we call that agility, portability, and control. Um, and as I said earlier, that ends up looking a lot like a supply chain. And I mentioned the global supply chain not because you know, Docker has invested a lot of time and energy in marketing materials that use shipping containers and, 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 and cranes and trucks, and we want to continue to reuse those, um, but because it really is like the global supply chain. You know, the global supply chain uh, you know, isn't centrally managed. Um, there is a vast and vibrant economy out there in the global physical supply chain, but we have agreed on certain things like, you know, what are the size and dimensions and hooks and holes for containers, or how do we apply tariffs, or how do we uh, enforce contracts? It's the minimal level that you need in order to have a supply chain that works and exchanges information. And it's no different in the software supply chain. You want to make sure that people have the ability to choose the languages and frameworks and tools that they want. You want to have uh, flexibility in terms of what goes into your environment, but also have rules about what goes in and what comes out. And so we call this containers as a service. Uh, we like to say internally, you know, if PaaS is too high and IaaS is too low, CAS is just right. Although plenty of people say, look, between IaaS and PaaS and CAS, sometimes you can't tell your ads from your elbow. Uh, but in a, in a CAS environment, Really what you're looking at is a self-service environment. This is not a service built on containers. It's a service that enables you to use containers, um, which means that you have facilities for developers, you have facilities for operations, and you have the facilities to tie those two together. Um, in the center, you have a central repository of trusted content. That content may come from uh, commercial third parties. It may come from other work groups. It may come from your work group, but regardless, Every container that is uh, in the central repository uh, can be traced back to source. You can know that it's been uh, scanned for vulnerabilities. You know that it can be digitally signed and can be digitally signed multiple times at the time it's created so that it never gets modified. Um, at the time it passes tests, uh, apply another digital signature. At the time it's approved by, uh, uh, for, for security purposes, apply another digital signature. And so at the end, what you have in the center is a set of containers that can be used to assemble new applications, a set of service bundles that can be deployed anywhere there's a Docker engine. And so then on the right-hand side, you have uh, operations. 
And where you may choose to deploy Docker, you also have flexibility. It can be on-premise. It can be uh, in public cloud. It can be in a virtual environment. It can be on bare metal servers. Docker doesn't have any, uh, uh, any dog in that fight or any cat. I want to be equal opportunity here. But, um, but what we do say is that if you do this right, you run you know, any official uh, image or any, any approved image uh, on any uh, Docker, Docker engine, uh, and you get a control plane that lets you make rules about what goes in and what comes out, lets you see where everything is running, uh, and lets you uh, remediate when things go wrong. If you pull, pull this together, this is called Docker CAS. Um, Docker CAS is uh, built uh, using a lot of the ingredients that you saw yesterday. As you might imagine, in a, in, a, in a CAS environment, your developers may be working with Docker for Mac or Docker for Windows. You may choose to run your applications uh, Docker for Azure, Docker for AWS. You may choose to run it uh, on Docker's commercially supported engines uh, on Red Hat, on Canonical, on bare metal servers, uh, on VMs. But you have all of the capabilities that you saw yesterday uh, in that 112 engine available uh, in an environment that has a trusted registry, that has a control plane, and security integrated throughout. What you don't see in here, uh, inside that blue box, is anything from Docker that's enforcing which, uh, what your infrastructure looks like. Your infrastructure uh, can be, again, your choice of public cloud, a virtual or physical. Uh, and you also don't see us coloring what's on top. Docker is designed to be used with the tools of your choice. That's not only the applications of your choice, but the CI CD systems of your choice, the monitoring systems of your choice. If you choose to use uh, advanced networking, if you choose to use advanced logging, if you try, try to use advanced monitoring, uh, available from hundreds of partners uh, out there. So I can go here and I continue to talk about PowerPoint, but you know, power corrupts and PowerPoint corrupts absolutely. So rather than, than talking uh, anymore, I'd like to get going with some demos. And so to show you what it looks like to deploy a Docker data center uh, and use CAS in a real production environment, I'd like to call up uh, Lily and Vivek. So. What? I'm an ops guy in enterprise. I work for the Vote Corp International Conglomerate. You've probably heard of us. I maintain all of our production workloads. It's Monday morning, 9 AM. I just got into work. Time to get started. <laughs> what does the fox say? I'm a developer, also an enterprise. I have an app that needs to be deployed, so I'm about to go talk to Ops about it. Hey, Vivek. Uh-huh. Vivek, yeah. hi. Mm -hmm. Are you ready to deploy the new app mm -hmm. from the Docker distributed application bundle I gave you? Docker? Why didn't you say so? All right, let's get started. So I'm just going to log into Universal Control Plane as an admin. So I just upgraded to the prototype version of UCP running the Docker Engine 112 in swarm mode. You're going to love this thing. Yeah, sure. So this is the dashboard for UCP. It gives me a high-level view of all the resources in my cluster. You got your controller health. You got your applications and images. You got your containers and service uptime, your node usage. Yeah, OK. OK, let's just go ahead and deploy. So I'm going to go here. This is pretty simple in UCP. All I'm just going to do is hit the Deploy button. Now, if I was deploying a single service consisting of one or more containers of the same type, then I'd just use UCP's form wizard. It makes it very easy to deploy a single service. You can set up things like the service name, the image name, permissions labels. Uh, but since we're going to do something a little more complicated, a full distributed application, I'm going to make use of the Upload Bundle feature. To do that, I'm going to click here. I'm going to upload the bundle that you gave to me. And there, you can see here that UCP parses the bundle file and shows us exactly what we're going to get for the application. You can see there's five services along with a network that connects all of these services. You got your database, you got your Redis key value store, um, you got. Yeah, Vivek, I know, I know. I, I built the app. Can we just deploy it? You, Please? You devs are all the same. <laughs> so, okay, we're just going to name this Enterprise, and then I'm going to hit deploy. 
And you can, you can see right here that in just one click, we were able to deploy a fully distributed application into our production cluster. Pretty cool, huh? Wow, you're really excited about deployments. So my app is up. Yeah, so let's take a look at one of the services so we can get a little more detail. So I just click on the vote service within the GUI. You can see here it comes from the 1.0 image of the vote image that you gave to me. Uh, you can see that we're currently running one container as a part of this task. We could run several more containers, but since we're in test dev mode, we only need one. The GUI of UCP also shows other resources that might be attached to the, to the service. So you can see the networks and what, por what ports have been published. You can see volumes or environment labels. Oh, let's take a look at the labels. So you see this ucp.access label that equals DockerCon? Mm -hmm. That'll come important if, theoretically, we have to do any access control testing. OK. So let's go ahead and take a look at your actual app. Yes. Oh, great. Looks like the enterprise version of the voting app is up. So we're done here, right? Whoa, Lily, we're just getting started. All right, we just created this app in a test dev environment, but now we need to bring it into production. I'm sure a lot of users out there are going to vote on this really important choice, right? Definitely. OK, so we need to make sure that we can scale up and handle all of that traffic. Within UCP, that's pretty simple. I'm going to go back to this service here. I'm going to hit the Edit button. And I'm going to scale this from one to, let's say, eight containers for now. That should handle the current traffic. And we can see here that in one click, we were able to scale up from one container to eight containers within the service that's fully load balanced and will handle whatever traffic we could possibly have to deal with. Nice. Looks like the service is green. Everything's good to go. I think we can get back to what we were doing before. Ugh, I just got an email from the business team. Sounds like the business guy wants to come in, check out our production environment. Uh, I think he's going to break something. Can you prevent that? Yeah, I already got this covered. UCP has a really strong role-based access control system, so I can set privileges around what the business guy is able to do in the cluster. It's pretty simple. I'll just go to the user management tab here. <clears throat> you can see that I already set up an account for the business guy. And I've created a business team, which I placed the business guy in. Now we're going to go to the permissions tab right here. Remember that DockerCon access label we had on all the services in your application? Yep. Well, I've given the business team view only rights to the DockerCon label. That means that the business team can inspect the service, but they can't actually make any changes. We should be good to go. OK, good. Well, here he comes. Log out, log out. Hey, Ops guy. Good to see you. You know, I've just been reading this great new book called The One Minute Hands-On Sales Manager with Seven Deadly Habits. Um, <laughs> and uh, I want to add some value here. Now, don't, don't worry. Uh, I was a pretty mean Fortran coder in my day. Um, and uh, I'm taking a class right now on, I think it's uh, Apple's Taylor Swift stack, something like that. I don't know. But anyway, can you show me what we're doing? Yeah, Ben, I've got an account set up just for you. Oh, wow. So let me log you in for convenience, just in case you happen to guess my password. Uh, and here you go. It's all yours. Oh, wow. Yeah, this is exactly what we should be doing. Um, it's got colors. <laughs> Lots of pretty colors. And buttons. Um, Containers, I thought we were a software company. Why are we dealing with uh, hardware? We are a software company, Ben. OK. That, that's software. Services, let me take a look at this. Wow, even more buttons and lines. This is great. Redis. So um, this is probably how I would have implemented it. Um, but you should know that we do have a corporate policy. Our corporate color uh, is blue. Uh, ben, uh, ben, this is red. red um, Redis I, is not, not a color. Allowed. I'm just going to remove this. It's OK. Am I sure I want to remove this service? Yes, I want to be decisive. Let me be decisive again. <laughs> access denied. Nobody denies me access. <laughs> Sorry, Ben. It's company policy. You got to go blame the security team. OK, I think I'm going to go add some value over there as well. You, you go do that. <laughs> Mm 
Wow, that was close. Yeah, luckily with UCP's access control, we can safeguard our cluster against unwanted intrusions. Friday evening, 5 p.m., time for me to go on a well-deserved vacation. Oh, where are you going? I'm going to Burning Man. <laughs> oh, cool. Me too. Nice hat. Thank you. But uh, I think mine's better. Man, I really need this trip. Luckily, it seems like your application is working just fine. You got a lot of users using this in production. Yeah. Hopefully nothing goes wrong in, produ in production in the last minute. Uh-oh. Pager duty alert. Pager duty alert. Oh, that can't be good. What's going on? Looks like the Docker security scanning service discovered an issue with one of our images. Uh. <laughs> is it my app? Uh, we'll have to check on Docker Trusted Registry to find out. That's okay. where we store all of our images. So I'm already logged into UCP here, and the single sign-on authentication should allow me to log into DTR instantly. So here we go. Oh, this is the new scanning UI within the prototype DTR. Continually monitors all of our images for vulnerabilities. It's really Dude, cool. Dude, just tell me, is it my app? It's your app. So. This is the enterprise repository with the vote image that you created. You see that 1.0 image that we had? You can see that the scanning service found a couple of issues. So let's take a look at the scanning report. We'll see a little more. So the scanning service scans through all the layers in the image and then checks against the CVE database in order to see if there's any vulnerabilities. Mm -hmm. You can see here that the biggest problem is a critical vulnerability in OpenSSL, something about an own nose implement. Ooh, this is bad. This isn't just any bug, it's nosebleed. <laughs> hey guys, the new J.Crew catalog come out or something? Um, look, I was reading on LinkedIn about this new vulnerability out there called nosebleed that apparently is impacting thousands of applications around the world. Are we at all exposed? Yeah, maybe just a little bit. Just a little bit? Oh my god, we need to launch our corporate CYA process. OK, um, I need both of you to forget about any plans you have for the weekend. We need to understand exactly where we're exposed, where the vulnerability exists. On all of our applications, we need to have a detailed plan for rolling this out. And meanwhile, I'm going to deal with really important things like uh, notifying our investors and notifying uh, the press. I'm going to pull together a big task force. This is our uh, corporate response and uh, prioritization task force. We'll be back here in an hour. Synergizers, assemble. Is it really that bad? I mean, are we not going to be able to go? No, Lily. We are going to Burning Man. Look, the Docker Security Service found the issue, told us exactly which component it's in. We can fix this. Let's do this. OK. Well, from the scanning service, we know it's an OpenSSL bug. And I've read that they already fixed the issue and released a new version. Right. So I should be able to just take the new version of OpenSSL and bring it into the enterprise base image that I maintain for all of your developer applications. So since they already patched it, I should just be able to do a build command, rebuild on 1.1 image for enterprise base. And that should just patch in the newest version of, of OpenSSL. There it is. It's downloading the newest layer right now. And it should be rebuilding the image right about here. OK, so now that we've managed to actually patch the new base image, I'm going to go ahead and push it to DTR so that you can make use of it. Uh, looks like it's just pushing the small change. OK, we should be good to go. So why don't you switch over to your laptop and uh, build the application for us? All right. So I will update the Docker file. Uh, you created version 1.1 of the base image. That's so right. I'll just bump the version here. And then we'll do a build. All right, I can see it's pulling down the new version of the base image. Um, once the build completes, I just need to push, right? Whoa, whoa, whoa. Don't forget to convert security compliance code TK421. That means that all production applications must be verified and signed for their images before they're deployed in the cluster. Vivek, this is going to take all night. No, it's pretty simple. All you got to do is export Docker content trust equals one. Oh, OK. I can do that. 
That'll go ahead, and when you export that, you can push the DTR like you normally do. It should work just fine. All right. So by enabling Docker Content Trust, the image gets signed automatically? That's right. When you push the DTR, Docker Content Trust ensures that the image is signed using your personal key. That means ops folks like us can verify that it's, in fact, you who made it. OK. Looks like it's asking for a passphrase. And pushed and signed. OK, so let's switch over to my laptop, and okay. we can check to see the new image in DTR. So I'm going to close this right here. Let's go ahead and OK, so the new 1.1 image has come in. It's been signed and pushed by Lily. Now the scanning service is scanning it. And no issues found. We're free of nice. vulnerabilities. <laughs> now we just need to redeploy this in production. OK, so I guess you'll need to take down every instance individually and then redeploy everywhere. No, it's actually a lot simpler than that. I'm just going to make use of Swarm's rolling update feature to load the new image into the application with no downtime to the actual production app. So to do that, I'm going to go to the Resources tab. And I'm going to go back to the service that, we were, that was affected, the vote service. I'm going to edit it again. And remember how we, you created the 1.1 image, right? Yep. I'm going to go ahead and switch that to 1.1. I'm going to set update parallelism equal to 2 and update delay equal to 5 seconds and hit Finish Editing. Now, what's going on here is that UCP and Swarm are replacing two containers based off of the 1.0 image with the 1.1 image every 5 seconds and then repeating the process. That ensures that I can monitor the application. And if something goes wrong, I can always revert back to the older version. But instead, if things look like they're going OK, we can just see all the new 1.1 images that are being created. And yeah, so in just one click, we were able to do a full rolling update to our application, patch a new version with no downtime in production. Oh. Disaster averted. Hey, guys. So uh, sorry you have to spend the, the weekend in the office, but uh, I did want to bring you uh, some coffee. It uh, doesn't have all the substances you might have gotten at Burning Man, but um, <laughs> so in any event, we've got the team. We're meeting in an hour. Uh, actually, Ben, we're good. Uh, Lily and I worked together, and we were able to solve the problem on our own. All of our SSLs are now closed? They're all, all open. But, but, but I thought, this, <laughs> but, but I thought this, this vulnerability impacted lots of applications. How do we know which applications have been impacted? Well, the scanning service actually routinely scans everything, and it only found the vulnerability in one image. We patched the image, we redeployed, so we're good. Yeah, but, 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 but you know, the, the, the enterprise voting app between ISO 9000 and 9001 is exploding. It's deployed across large numbers of servers across our enterprise. You, surely you haven't upgraded all of them. No. All we had to do is fix the issue in the image once, and then we could use rolling updates to patch the application with no production loss and downtime. All right, right, but then now there's the most critical thing that we need to do, which is make sure that we file the TK421 paperwork. Uh, we're going to let you do that, business guy. For us, problem solved on our end. Time to go to Burning Man. Yep. <laughs> Bye, Ben. <laughs> All right, nice, nice job. Thank you. Thank you, Lily, and thank you, Vivek. Let's give them another round of applause. All right, so what you saw there uh, is you saw um, an environment where new applications are able to be loaded as service bundles, they're able to be deployed, they're able to be auto-scaled. Obviously, a lot of the things that you saw yesterday, you also saw an environment where uh, the system is constantly monitoring for vulnerabilities. When vulnerabilities are detected, uh, they're able to be fixed in a, in a rapid way. Um, you know, obviously, security is a really important uh, aspect of everything that we do at Docker. Um, a lot of focus has been paid in the past uh, on security, of course. Um, but a lot of people have this view that security is really about preventing some arcane, unknown vulnerability. And the truth of the matter is, and we know this from talking to our customers as well as from personal experience, it's generally not some arcane vulnerability that gets you. It's the 10,000 known vulnerabilities that you have that you've let in, you can't find, and you can't fix. If you're running your software supply chain correctly, uh, you can get yourself to the point where you know exactly what you're running in, in production. You know that it's been scanned. You know that it's been signed. And that obviously reduces the chances very significantly of letting anything bad into your environment. But if something bad happens, it's also important to make it easy to recover. And this is about having security that also implies resiliency. You know, a year and a half ago or so, a lot of people were questioning, OK, containers seem cool, but 
what do we do about security? And I'm, I'm pleased to say that now, not only do we have some of the most security conscious organizations on the planet using Docker, uh, but they're adopting Docker now not in spite of their security concerns, but because it fundamentally helps them address their security concerns. I, it's fair to say at this point that deploying inside a container is actually safer. Um, and while you can use Docker in conjunction with a lot of other tools, um, by using Docker the right way, uh, you're making yourself not only more secure, you're making yourself more agile and more resilient. So we've talked a lot uh, about the underlying technology, but as I mentioned at the beginning of this talk, um, it really goes beyond the tools and, uh, that Docker itself provides. Uh, this is about having an entire ecosystem that makes it possible for enterprises to adopt Docker at scale. Um, and there are a number of different aspects to this. I want to start by talking about, uh, about content. So content is king for applications. Um, as you may know, one of the first things we did when we launched the Docker project was launch something called Docker Hub. And this was a place for individuals to uh, find base containers, to show their applications, to share containers. Uh, and as we talked about yesterday, it's very exciting that this has now grown from 14,500 uh, Dockerized apps at the first DockerCon to 460,000 now. Now, that's exciting, a lot of uses of those, but you know, the containers that are there are of uh, you know, varying quality. Um, about a year and a half ago, we also introduced this notion of official repos, um, where, for example, you can get a uh, version of Mongo that's built by uh, MongoDB. You can get a, a version of uh, Ubuntu built by Canonical. The important part is that these have been built. They have been tested. They come from verified sources. Uh, they are now scanned using our scanning, source, uh, scanning service and uh, digitally signed. And that has been very popular. What we're now increasingly hearing from our customers is they not only want access to great open source content, they want access to great commercial content. And they want to be able to get it in a way that is uh, commercial, that is licensable, that is supportable. And so what should we do? Well, I'm very pleased to announce that today uh, we are bringing into private beta the Docker Store. <laughs> this is a marketplace for validated software and tools. They're available in the Docker format. Uh, tested to run on, uh, on Docker engines uh, from businesses and publishers. The things that are there are what you might expect. The ability to easily search for the right applications, easy to deploy them. Uh, we have great free content as well as great commercial content. Uh, everything is scanned, everything is signed. Um, and in a very exciting move, even though we're just moving into private beta, we've already got a great set of partners who are publishing and we'd like to encourage others to come. We have 35 partners as we're launching now, but we want to call all publishers. Again, this is open for free content. It's op open for commercial content. Uh, we have tools in place for things like managing entitlement and managing payment and managing licensing. Uh, and if you'd like to learn more, uh, we encourage both users as well as publishers to come uh, to a talk today at 3.55. So the Docker store. We talked about it yesterday, but it bears repeating. Um, there's no perfect solution that applies to all use cases. Um, one of the most critical things about being able to adopt Docker in the enterprise is know that you're not just working with Docker, you're working with an entire ecosystem. Uh, we're thrilled that there is such a large ecosystem of tools uh, around Docker. As I mentioned yesterday, if you search on GitHub, there are 95,000 different projects uh, that are titled Docker. Um, uh, if you uh, talk to the VCs, over 100 startups have been funded in this area. But whether it's small companies or large companies, there's amazing uh, innovation that's happening in areas like networking, uh, clustering and scheduling, storage, management, uh, security. As I mentioned earlier, uh, we have partnerships with a large number of monitoring tools. Uh, we want Docker to fit into your organization. We don't want to force fit your organization to fit with Docker. And so if you have tools and techniques that you, you want to use, that's exciting for us. Docker is all about standard interfaces and all about an ecosystem. So I've talked about the first two uh, things as we go around the wheel here. I'd now like to talk about a few of the others. So as I mentioned earlier, adopting anything like Docker uh, in production is a human transformation uh, as well as a, uh, uh, as a technological transformation. Uh, Docker provides support. 
We provide training. We provide long-term support. So while Docker likes to innovate really rapidly, we also recognize that many of our customers uh, want to uh, stay on older versions of Docker. We offer uh, long-term support for Docker. And we not only offer it ourselves, we offer it through a great network of partners uh, that includes uh, great training partners, great support partners, uh, where you can have a single uh, organization that you call uh, to support all of the things that are deployed into your organization. Uh, we've also tried to make integration and procurement easy. You know, it's great if you can deploy Docker with one click, but if you have to fill out 40 forms to buy it, that's probably a bad thing. Uh, Docker is available if you're a government customer on GSC, GSA and Soup. Uh, we've tried to design uh, our pricing so that Docker grows with you. Uh, is available in various forms of subscription, um, uh, and again, available not only directly through us, but through a wide network of partners. And of course, critical to Docker is that it runs on any infrastructure. And we have a number of great infrastructure partners, a number of great partners that we've worked with. There were two that I wanted to call out in particular. Uh, the first partner I wanted to call out is Hewlett Packard Enterprise. Uh, two weeks ago, yeah. Uh, two weeks ago at HPE Discover, we announced uh, a really broad-ranging partnership with HPE. Uh, among this, every ProLiant server, as well as a number of other uh, lines of servers, will be shipping with Docker commercial engine and support included by default. This is a radical change, which means basically getting started with Docker uh, is as simple as getting, uh, getting your first server. Uh, Docker Data Center is available through all uh, HPE channels. Uh, support is integrated. Purchasing is integrated. Uh, and we've done a broad range of other integrations that include making Docker work well uh, in validated references with uh, HPE converged and hyperconverged systems, uh, as well as a broad range of integrated solutions with things like 3PAR. Uh, if you like to manage your environment using one view, we can connect uh, Docker's control plane with the HPE control plane. Again, a great partnership. And for those who want to work with HPE, uh, we're really excited to see this uh, adopted in a much broader level. So our, our thanks to HPE. Another really critical uh, support partner for, for Docker is Microsoft. Um, a lot of people are very excited about uh, the work that we're doing with Microsoft to enable uh, Docker on Windows Server. Uh, but the partnership goes far beyond that. Uh, of course, you saw yesterday Docker for Azure. Uh, Docker Data Center is also available on Azure. Um, as Microsoft moved all of its .NET uh, to make it available in Linux, those are now all available as containers in the Docker Hub and, and will be available soon in the Docker Store. A uh, broad range of other things that are going on. And rather than me continuing to talk, uh, I'd like to invite uh, Mark Rusinovich on stage. So with that, Mark. So where's your Okay. Good morning, everybody. It's great to be back at DockerCon. I was at DockerCon last year. Like Ben mentioned, it was the first time that we showed Windows Server containers. And I'm proud to say that we've got Windows Server containers now out in technical preview so you can play with them. We also have Hyper-V containers. And our partnership with Docker has just been fantastic over the last year. I've got some really cool stuff to show you this morning that all really highlights our partnership and our focus on getting containers ready for the enterprise, making the enterprise, addressing enterprise needs when it comes to running containers in production. So what I want to start with is, Ben mentioned, we've got Docker Data Center now in the Azure marketplace. So if I click on New here and go to Virtual Machines, we're so excited about this that if I go to See All, this is going to show us our featured items and here in a second. Here we go. Docker Data Center is the featured item in the Azure Marketplace today. And so Docker Data Center here is deeply integrated with Azure. It is launched here with a create click as an Azure Resource Manager template that initiates a simple form-filled process where I can, within a few minutes, get a highly available first-class Docker Data Center cluster up and running in public Azure. It looks like my demo god's uh, drink didn't work as expected. Uh, here we go. Let me try that again. So here's the uh, simple form. 
fill in a, a couple of these pages. Like I said, in a few minutes, we get this Docker Data Center cluster up and running. And I've already gone ahead and done this. We've got a Docker Data Center cluster running in public Azure. I'm going to switch over here to the Universal Control Plane interface for that cluster and just show you the VMs that are sitting underneath this, the nodes that are part of this cluster. Like I mentioned, what you launch is a highly available one. And so for high, high availability, we need at least three controller nodes. And you can see those three controller nodes up here at the top. They're all healthy. And then you can see the swarm cluster nodes that I've got here underneath. We've got eight of them. And I'm going to dig into some of the characteristics of those nodes here in a few seconds. But the other aspect of Docker Data Center is the Docker Trusted Registry. And we're going to switch over to that view and see that I've got a bunch of con container images here deployed to the registry. I've got some test containers, images. I've got the container images for that enterprise voting app as well, a different version of it. That voting app is running already in that Swarm cluster. And I'm going to switch to the user interface for that, where I can go ahead and vote, just like you've seen in yesterday's demos. I'm going to click on cats and just verify that this really, truly is running. Switch over to the results view. And uh-oh. Looks like somebody else wrote this code, not me. Uh, maybe the business guy. But just like always at Microsoft, I'm the one that's called in to fix these things. So we're going to have to switch over to the code behind this and find out what the bug is. So I'm going to switch over to Visual Studio Code. This is Visual Studio Code running on the Mac with Docker for Mac. For the first time, you're going to be seeing this with C Sharp code. Before I switch to that code, let me show you this debug compose file, which is describing that application as it's going to be deployed when I debug it here locally on the Mac. You can see at the top here, we've got the voting app container. We've got the result app container. And we also have a worker container. And that's where the bug happens to be, processing that vote. The code for that is in this program.cs file. You can see the update vote method. And as you scan through this code, you can probably see, I'm really good at seeing obfuscated code bugs. I can see one right here. It looks like we've got an insider threat on the, the side of the dogs here that has caused a, a subtle bug here somewhere in this area. And I'm going to verify that that bug is in that line of code by debugging it again locally here on the Macintosh. So I'm going to switch over here to the debugger after I set a breakpoint and launch it. Now it's going to take a few seconds to build these images and launch them locally. Ready to go. Switch back to the browser. And I'm going to take a look at the local. You can see this is a local host. The same app. Click on cats. And we hit the breakpoint right there in Visual Studio Code. I can take a look at the value of that votes variable. You can see it's A. That represents cats. B would represent dogs. If I step over this line, we should still see it say A, but we actually see that it's switched to B. And that's also highlighted up here in the variables, the locals view, as a changed variable value. So that does appear to be where the bug was introduced. So let's get rid of that bug. I'm going to comment it out. And I'm going to restart the application here and just verify that we did actually fix it before we're going to push this thing up into production. So it's rebuilding. And a couple seconds here. The site's updated. Let's go back. Let's do a refresh. And oh, hit the breakpoint again. Let me say go. Switch back. And I've selected cats. Let's go take a look at the results on the local site. And you can see that, sure enough, the bug is fixed. Now we've got our vote accurately reflected for cats. We're ready to deploy this to production now. So to do that, I'm going to come back to Visual Studio Code. I'm going to stop the debugger. And we see we've got a, a code change here in program.cs. So I'm going to add a little message, fixed bug a commit message, and then push this up into, commit it, push this up into our production CI CD pipeline, which we'll come back and take a look at in one second. While that's being pushed up there, let's go take a look at the production compose file, because there's some interesting attributes of this version of the compose application for running in production in a public 
facing way because what we want is our front ends to be sitting behind the Azure load balancers. And this is part of that cool integration between Docker Data Center and Azure is that it's deeply integrated with things like the Azure load balancer. And the way that we've said that we want the voting app and the result app to be on nodes that are connected to that load balancer is by setting placement constraints on those nodes so that Swarm knows that these containers need to go on those particular nodes behind the load balancer. And the placement constraint, as you can see, is UCP node. Let's go take a look at where I push this build up into Visual Studio. Team services, which is a, a hosted CI CD service complete with source control. And you can see I've kicked off a build here. It's queued. And if I click Edit, we can see the steps in that CI CD pipeline. We want to make sure that as it goes out to production, that it's rebuilt and it's tested before it's actually committed and, and updating the live site. And so the steps that you can see here are all about rebuilding the application, doing a Docker build of it, tagging that Docker build with a build number, and then running the functional tests on that to make sure that it's actually fixed. Tagging that if they pass those tests with the latest tag, and then pushing that up into the, that Docker trusted registry as part of that DDC cluster, and then finally pushing that out to the Swarm cluster as an update. Let's go back to build, builds, and we can check on the status of that thing. And you can see if we double click, we can see the current status of that. So it's still building and testing. While it's doing that, I want to show you another interesting aspect of that cluster that I've got running. So we'll go back to UCP. And these are, like I mentioned, are the nodes that are part of that swarm cluster. There's one node here at the bottom called local Linux that is different from the other ones. It's subtle, but the subnet addresses are different from the other nodes. And this reason that this subnet is different for this local Linux node is that it actually is running in a different cloud. It's not running in public Azure. It is actually running right here on this server right here, which is running a product called Azure Stack. This is essentially Azure on your own hardware in your own data center. Azure Stack includes the infrastructure services of public Azure, some of the platform services, as well as the portal and the API surface that matches public Azure. So we get this consistent experience going from public Azure to on-prem. What we've got here is a hybrid Docker data center cluster that spans on-prem to public Azure. The VMs on this server are connected to public Azure using a site-to-site -site virtual private network for secure connection between these nodes that are on the back end as well as the nodes that are on the front end. All right. So let's go back and check out the status of our build. It looks like that we finished our build. So let's verify that that app is working up in production. If I do a refresh here, let's make some, do some votes. Still refreshing. Oh. And, uh, Let's try that one more time. Yeah, the, you know, I normally don't do a shot to the demo god, so maybe that's what threw them off this morning. And yeah, that's interesting. Universal control plane still working. Let's give it one more shot. All right, well, you have to trust me on this one. So I've, <laughs> somebody has to have a demo failure here. I've taken it for the team. Uh, Yeah, the results app is working. Uh, so maybe I introduced a bug in my, uh, <laughs> when I thought I was fixing it. All right, so uh, in any case, one of the things that we want to do once we have it up in production, a key part of the story for managing things in production is monitoring the behavior of those containers. And what we need for a, a scenario like this where we've got a cluster that spans on-prem and public cloud is a container man, uh, ma monitoring service they can also monitor hybrid scenarios like this, whether it's on-prem containers, containers in another public cloud, containers in Azure. And we have such a service. It's called Operations Management Suite. I'm going to switch over to the Operations Management Suite portal. 
And it consists of a, operations management suite, or OMS, consists of a, a bunch of different functionality, everything from backup to, to site recovery to live migration of virtual machines. But one of the key features is monitoring. Monitoring for virtual machines, monitoring for servers, and monitoring for containers. You can see there's a container slice here on the dashboard. And when I click into it, we can see a bunch of different views of our containers running across our production servers. You can see right here. I can see it. Uh, please turn off your cell phones. I don't, <laughs> don't know what's going on here with the Wi-Fi, with the network. Uh, OK. What you would see here, let me just describe it. Let me paint a picture for you. Looks like we see some activity. There we go. All right, so we see a bunch of different views. We see a container view. So this shows us that we've got 68 containers running across all the nodes in that swarm cluster. We've got eight hosts, like I've told you and I showed you in UCP. And we also see views like which ones are healthy or unhealthy, which ones are consuming a lot of CPU, which ones are consuming a ton of memory, and then an overall status. We can see that 66 are running. That looks like my failed one for my demo failure. And then we've got a stopped one as well. So that's a total of 68 no, uh, containers that we've got deployed up into that swarm cluster. So that's OMS for monitoring, a hybrid scenario. Now, one of the things that I want to take a look at is what containers are running in that Linux node sitting here on this Azure Stack server. So I'm going to connect to that using a remote desktop connection. And now I'm sitting here in Azure Stack looking at not the public Azure portal, but the portal for Azure Stack. And you can see that it looks almost exactly like the public Azure portal. It includes the same marketplace experience, the deployment experience, as well as the dashboard. And I've got a couple of interesting things pinned to this dashboard. One of them is a, a Windows VM, which is the one that I'm connected into right now to look at this dashboard. The other one is a, the Linux, local Linux node that we saw in the UCP Swarm cluster view. I'm going to connect to that one using SSH. And we're going to take a look at what containers are running inside of that by doing a Docker PS. And you can see that we've got a couple of them. Here's the worker that failed worker, the one with the bug that's still in it that caused it the failure. But we also have a database running here as well. Now let's take a look at that database. I'm going to connect to it. And I'm going to modify the contents of that database directly to show you that that public-facing site happens to be the real, really backed by this database. So this is the, that results view. And if I update the votes table, and I'm going to switch the vote to A to, to make it cats. And we see that, sure enough, I, I updated the database contents in real time, so the results container up, running up in Azure reflected that change right here sitting on the SQL in this database. So that database looks pretty cool, doesn't it? It was able to update a variable as I set it. Let's see what that database happens to be. So here it is. This happens to be Microsoft SQL Server running on Ubuntu. So so what you're seeing for the first time here, and it's, it's kind of mind blowing, you're seeing Microsoft SQL Server running on Linux in a Docker container on Azure Stack in a swarm cluster that's hybrid being managed by Docker Data Center running up in public Azure. So. So is your class if you are wow, that is uh, really impressive. Mark, you have the uh, slide advancer. <laughs> so apparently the demo gods are still, uh, still with us in some uh, safe, strange safe, shape or form, but uh, why don't we bring up the next slide? Uh, so again, big thanks to Mark. Actually, another round of applause for Mark. That was, that was fantastic. 
just to prove that what you saw at the beginning of that demo is actually real, um, I think go back one slide. Yes, uh, something really critical happened yesterday. Um, somewhere over the state of Kansas, um, <laughs> Docker's head of sale deployed Docker Data Center on Azure using airline Wi-Fi. So if you want to talk about ease of deployment uh, and democratizing things, you really can't get any better than that. So uh, Roger, stand up, take a bow. That's pretty impressive. <laughs> And then this was a Slack message he sent us. All right, so uh, we talked about it taking an ecosystem, uh, talked about a lot of the important things that come into this. But ultimately, one of the most important things in enabling enterprise adoption is knowing that other enterprises have adopted a technology and have done so successfully. Uh, we do have a lot of user groups that are available for different people in, in different enterprises to exchange information. Uh, today, I have a special treat for you. Um, if you would think about who you would want to hear from, Imagine you'd want to hear from somebody who's running mission-critical applications, who's running Docker in production, Docker Data Center and Docker Swarm, doing so in an environment with a lot of different applications from uh, next generation applications, applications that have been around uh, for 15 or more years, doing so in an environment that is both uh, on-prem and public cloud, uh, and doing so well and doing so successfully. Uh, for me, that would be a big payday. It turns out that the person that we're going to have speak to you is a person who helps make payday happen for one-sixth of all Americans. Big reveal. Uh, Keith Fulton from ADP, which does, of course, a lot more. But uh, with that, I'd like to ask uh, Keith Fulton to come up here and uh, share his experiences. So Keith. Hi, everybody. I'm very happy to be here. Thanks uh, for the intro, Ben. And thanks for the chance to be up here to talk about why ADP is excited about Docker. So let's dive right in. I think to start with, probably most of you have heard of ADP. Should I get a show of hands on that? Yeah, everybody. Uh, we, have, we have over 630,000 clients, B2B clients that we serve around the world in uh, over 100 countries. We do 5 million logins a day, which uh, is a lot to, for us to manage and secure. And, so, and we have a wide variety of applications that I'd like to show you. So we're known for, HC, for, for payroll, and that's where we started. That's our bread and butter. But really, we've broadened out. HCM is in the title there. That stands for Human Capital Management, and that's kind of the name of our category now, where we do everything from recruiting, job websites, and posting boards, and all that kind of stuff, and all the way through to retirement and 401k planning and thinking about your death and your life insurance beneficiaries uh, and everything in between, time tracking, uh, absence management, benefits tracking. We actually provide healthcare and manage healthcare for more people than healthcare.gov does. Okay, all kinds of different areas within HCM that we do. So we have a breadth as well as a depth and scale to our offering, and that makes things really complicated for us. So anyway, let's, uh, let's move on. So why, then, do we think Docker is key to our future acceleration? And I think, I think it comes down to that we have been around for now, I think, for about 65 years. And we have always viewed ourselves as a services company. We're there to help our clients and kind of offload complexity from them. But now, because the competition is getting so fierce, every company is becoming a tech company. And that, Technology is the way that companies are measured, whether you're talking about in any industry at all, including in HR industry. And so I think really for us, Docker is a key point of acceleration on how we're going to make our product development process faster and compete better. So let's talk about competition in general. Like, Why does Docker mat mat matter to competition? And I think uh, if we view this stuff as a race, it's a, it's a good way to think about it. And generally, like the drivers of these cars, you know, the executives in a company, the leaders, they have a sense of what, where they are competitively and what their position is. They know from wins and losses. They know from the word on the street. They're talking to clients. They've got an idea of where they are. Just like it's hard to tell in this picture 
who's ahead between those two cars? Well, probably those two drivers know because they're right next to each other. The, the issue, though, is that in this race, there is no finish line. And when the race goes on forever, the fact of the matter of like who is ahead at this moment is not as interesting as who's gaining and who's losing. What is the speed of those, of those cars? And so speed ends up being the thing we all care about, and momentum. And so let's talk about speed. So in a world where every company is a tech company, the speed of execution of that company comes down to who codes faster. And you know, think of all the untold effort that we've spent over the past two decades in trying to code faster. It all, most of it falls under the heading of agile transformation. And so we went through, we started with waterfall development. Then we went to extreme programming and pair programming and scrum programming. And uh, we have platform strategies and metadata strategies and drag and drop GUI tools and all kinds of stuff. And it's all about going faster. We've done everything we can think of except for maybe sending developers to typing school so they can type faster or something. But at the end of the day, that's, that's been good, but it's not enough either. And so coding faster isn't actually the client experience. Who ships faster is the client experience. And so I love this, this metaphor of the pit stop because uh, I don't know how many of you here follow Grand Prix racing at all for Formula One. There's a hand, a couple hands. Yeah, good. So the Grand Prix of Monaco was three weeks ago. There was a guy named Riccardi who was in the lead, and he had a pit stop that was a disaster because the average Formula One pit stop now takes one and a half seconds to change four tires and refill the car. One and a half seconds. This guy's pit stop was five seconds, and it will be talked about for decades for that extra three and a half seconds because he lost the race over that pit stop. Okay, so I think that in, in this world, like the cars cost $30 million and the drivers are celebrities, but the pit crews win and lose the races. And so I think like in our world, we've, we've, we've started to recognize this as we talked about DevOps and we try to get devs and ops to be friends and to work together, to communicate better, to go have beers. You know, that's the, the cliche we always hear, right? We want, we want to shift certain tasks to the left and shift right on other tasks and make everybody work perfectly. But I think actually that is not done enough. And I think Docker actually shows us the way for how, how we can go to a new kind of DevOps. And so the way I like to, the, the way I like to characterize this is that there becomes a clean separation between packing the containers and shipping the containers. The transportation business is a different business than the manufacturing business that loads those containers. And so as a result, like the devs can work on things and the forklifts or your, your automation tools, I often nickname that forklift Jenkins. You know, so we have, we have ways of filling up the containers and we get better at doing that. But the ops guys, they have thousands of containers around the world that they need to track and keep and move and do efficiently and stack well and track their state. So they have a clear job and the common denominator, the handoff point for that is Docker. And I think it's one of the reasons why Docker has really gone viral in the past three years. Um, so this is the potential that we have at large organizations to revolutionize how we ship code. So, you know, I'm, I know this is a big room full of people that are already sold on Docker. So I'm not gonna go into a big, long philosophical thing about why Docker is awesome. Okay, but you may have guessed from this slide that I have three things that seem unique about ADP or things that are interesting about what we're doing there. So let's dive into those. First of all, we often talk about how, you know, we see pictures of containers and they're always rectangular boxes, all this. This is a special kind of container though. Not all containers look that way. This is one for nuclear waste. They transport stuff, spent fuel from reactors on these kinds of containers. And I think this, this fits ADP's metaphor as well. We have sensitive stuff that we're putting in these containers. We have 55 million social security numbers on file, including probably most of yours in this room. Think about it, okay? <laughs> we moved, last year we moved $1.8 trillion through the ACH system in America. 10% of the GNP of the country was moved around actually four separate times through ADP machines. 
Uh, we, we are considered critical infrastructure by the U.S. government, and we work with FBI and other three-letter acronym agencies uh, to, to actually go after state-sponsored hackers and all kinds of stuff. We have a top 10 most wanted list that we track with the FBI, and we, we've actually arrested four of those people in the last 12 months. We work every day with these kinds of people. Thank you, I love that. We need consequences for these guys. So anyway, security is a huge deal for us. And uh, we consider ourselves a pretty high value target. And so hardening the containers actually is really important to us. And this goes back to what Ben said about going to containers because of we need more security, not in spite of needing more security. And so three areas of this that I think are interesting. First of all, this idea that Docker Data Center will only run signed binaries, where we know the provenance of the, of the servers and of all the layers within those images, uh, is important. We need to know that we trust what's in, in, in production. The second layer, though, is automated container scanning that's on a more continuous basis. We need to know that what's running now is what we started running before. And if something's been compromised or hacked, then we need to know that by comparing the images to what was originally there. And then third, I think this issue of Docker trusted registries. We use multiple registries at ADP uh, because at, in the production level, we want the most trusted, most vetted, most stripped down minimal containers that we can get. But if we only have those, then we limit developer freedom to download and to experiment and to find things on Docker Hub that they might want to try. And so to allow them the freedom to, to experiment, but to also lock down our production environment very much, we've actually created three separate repositories. There's a middle stage as well. For anything goes, this is what we think we want, and this is what we have that we've totally vetted. And we have a whole process for how we promote in those environments, how we scan and score, and what, th what the thresholds of certification have to be to get to each level. So I think this is an area where um, ADP has put a lot of work into trying to be sure that we're certain of what's going into production while still giving developers freedom to do what they want to do and to maximize their own productivity. Um, disparate systems. OK, I mentioned to you before that we have a broad variety of tools. We have two or 300 products that we offer in 120 countries. Most of these are large systems at scale running in our private cloud. I should have mentioned before that of the 630,000 clients, over 500,000 of those clients are running in our data centers. We are our client's cloud. The public versus private, our clients probably consider us to be part of the public cloud. OK, so all this stuff is running, many, many, many different systems running at scale. And so the ripple effects and the way that those systems could interact um, are, are essentially a or could be a risk for us. Um, so let's talk about how we do this. I, I don't think it's too earth shattering, but what we're doing is we're starting small. We start with very small clusters. It's actually multiple clusters for a single product. And so the way we start by scaling, is maybe a swarm can handle hundreds or thousands of nodes in theory, but for us, we might start with 10 nodes or 20 nodes and have several of those for a product, and maybe hundreds in some cases. But as, over time, those nodes will, the clusters will grow, and the swarms will organically take on more and more volume, kind of like the raindrops on the hood of this car, where as it, as it rains, the drops get bigger, and then eventually the drops touch, and they merge, and then the swarms start to coalesce into bigger and bigger structures. And so as that happens, we will start to have a single swarm for a product. And then the lines between the products will blur. And as the line between the products will blur, the lines between the environments will blur. And that really freaks my security people out as we <laughs> talk about that. But um, then you can imagine that we have data center level clusters that are covering our entire data centers and spanning multiple DR kind of data centers. I think the last span for us will be public versus private cloud, where you know, we will have most of our systems internal, but then when we need to scale beyond what we normally would do for peak loads, we might offload that to Azure or to Amazon or to someone else. And there will come a point where I think most of the IT people in ADP that are you know, intensively debating public versus private clouds, in the future I think most of them won't care that the swarm will manage it. And there will be a few people who know, but it'll mostly be a financial decision about what we decide to do. And to the rest of us, it will be an abstraction layer beyond which we don't care. So the last 
area that I'd like to talk about is microservices. Okay, so everybody agrees that microservices are awesome, don't we? I think so. Once you see them, yeah, there you go. Once you see it in action, you, can't, you, you have to have microservices. And it's kind of like chicken McNuggets. Like, everybody loves nuggets, okay? <laughs> no one wants a gnaw on a bone anymore if you've had a couple of nuggets. So it's like, and chicken McNuggets are convenient. They, like, we've pressed them down, they're bite-sized, they're standardized, they're pressed into the same shapes, they all kind of look the same, okay? And so it's great, and it's handy to think about a box of nuggets as your system, and your 20 McNuggets in a thing is your whole distributed architecture, okay? But we don't, we don't actually have nuggets, though. Oh. <laughs> Thank you. So we don't, we don't actually have nuggets, though, at ADP. Like, we wish we had nuggets. We're working on nuggets, okay? What we have is chickens, okay? We have, <laughs> like we, <laughs> so we have, we have monolithic apps, okay, that are all together, and they're cohesive units that all are, are one thing. And so the chicken, I, I, he looks kind of worried, doesn't he, right? He could be <laughs> nuggetized, okay? But in these products, but in these products, like, these are large products. I think you've said of lar we're large, right? So some of these apps are millions and millions of lines of code. And they're code that could be a decade old or older. Okay, so what do we do? How do we, if we agree that Docker is awesome, and we agree that microservices are awesome, what do we do about our chickens? And so this is where I'm going to switch to a different food and say, we have an ice cream strategy here, OK? We're going to take this, the tub right, that the ice cream is in in that picture is a container. And the Baskin Robbins that contains that container has 50 huge containers full of different kinds of ice cream. And if they didn't have those containers separating out the ice cream, they couldn't manage the Baskin Robbins. But the problem is that the big containers only take you so far. And then what you need is, is you need small containers called waffle cones, and you're going to <laughs> scoop out a piece of your small code, and you're going to put it into a separate waffle cone, and that is now your microservice. So what you have then is a hybrid in your applications going forward and an evolutionary path where your large monolithic systems will get carved up by the ice cream scoop refactor method, of, and you'll end up with a row of cones on the side and a half tub full of ice cream. There, and the interesting stuff, the stuff that changes a lot, thank you. But the, the cool part about it is that the stuff that changes a lot is the stuff that will get refactored first. The interesting things and the stuff that's really subject to a lot of activity will be the part that's in the microservices, and that will become the part that's easier to work with the fastest. And the stuff that doesn't change very much and that just works and is there all the time and is invariant, that will be what remains in the big container and it's waiting for refactoring at a later date if you need it, and if you don't, that's okay too. So this hybrid strategy is how ADP is attacking big containers and the legacy problem of monolithic apps. So anyway, I hope you see with all of those that like Docker and ADP, we have a real strategy. We really know what we're doing on this. And we have a lot of people working to make this happen across the world um, in our company. We're really excited to be with Docker and to be uh, partners on this. So thank you very much. Well, that was, that was awesome. I was going to say, let's go out and get some beers, but I think I'm going to go say, let's go out and get some McNuggets and ice cream uh, while driving around in a Formula One. That sounds like a lot more fun. Um, <laughs> hey, Keith, thank you again. That was, that was awesome. All right, well, I don't think I could add anything to what Keith just said. So a uh, few closing remarks, and then uh, go out and enjoy the rest of the conference. Uh, if you're interested in learning more about Docker Data Center, we have a bunch of breakout sessions that are happening. Uh, there's a hands-on lab in the Expo Hall. Um, and of course, if you want to try it, there's a free trial. If you want to be as daring as our head of sales, you can even try installing it uh, on the plane on the way home. Uh, and hope you enjoy the rest of the day, too. We've got an amazing lineup of sessions and talks, hands-on labs. Uh, please bump up. We're very close to our goal. Uh, please get a Docker selfie, and please make sure that you come back for the closing general session. The closing general session, if you haven't been to DockerCon before, is when we show all of the coolest hacks with Docker. So hope to see you there, and thank you again. Have a great rest of your day.